There was a book about an unknown world, where majestic yet petrifying beings lived. Grotesque creatures lurked in the shadows, and skies were eternally gray. It described an obscure and dreary land that had more volcanoes than hills. An endless curtain of smoke enshrouded everything. A place so dark and dangerous that it was bound to instill unsurmountable fear to those who would imagine it. And yet, the story in the book was of a man who longed to live there. The book became a subject of discussion soon after it was released, admired by the fans and analyzed by book critics. It garnered both negative and positive reactions. But aside from avid readers and fellow writers, the book gained an unexpected attention outside of the usual crowd because of the controversy that came with it. A few days after it hit the shelves, the author of the book named Edmund Howell mysteriously disappeared from the surface of the earth. Strangely enough, some people believed that his disappearance had a connection with his last work. One obvious aspect of the story in his book that the readers noticed was Edmund's undeniable similarity to the main character. It was a fairly common practice for writers to project their personalities to the characters in their own stories. However, it seemed that there was something more behind Edmund's main character than a mere projection of himself. The protagonist in the book was a middle-aged author who was mourning for his wife's passing, and they claimed that this was based on what the author was experiencing at the time. Mrs. Howell passed away two years before the book was published. According to the fans, Edmund never got over her death. He began writing the book soon after his wife had died, and his pain was deeply reflected through the lines of the main character in the book. Mrs. Howell was murdered in their home while Edmund was out of the country. Unfortunately, she did not receive the justice she deserved since the perpetrator was never identified. There were rumors that the murderer was the author's fan who grew obsessed with the man himself rather than his works. Some had suggested that his last book was an artistically elaborate spread known to the world. They deemed the fictional story as an expressive narrative of Edmund Howell while he was in the process of completely giving in to the sorrow that was eating him from the inside. However, I soon realized that the story was not only an imaginative form of his depression, it was explaining something much simpler, but much harder to believe. I was assigned to investigate the case, and it grew more complicated as I learned more about it. The last person who saw Edmund was his editor, who stayed with him at the time. According to her, the author never left his office for days after the book was released. It wasn't unusual for Edmund to lock himself in his office whenever he was writing. However, the editor grew worried when he didn't come out for three days straight, even though he was already done with the book. When the writer didn't respond after calling him out several times, it was then when she realized that he was no longer there. There was no way for him to get out of the house without being seen. All of the windows in the house had iron railings installed due to what happened to Mrs. Howell and the editor would have seen him if he walked out of the door. With no signs of forced entry nor any possibility of foul play, the author just suddenly vanished without leaving his house. The editor initially became a suspect, since she was the only person around when the writer disappeared. But she was proven innocent after further interrogations. In her statement, she mentioned that the writer would talk about nothing else but the world in his story ever since his wife passed away. Aside from his editor, another person that Edmund was often in contact with was a psychologist, whom he visited almost every week. At first, the therapist was quite adamant in not giving out any records from his sessions with the writer due to confidentiality reasons. But when he was given an official order to disclose any information that could help with the investigation, he was obliged to comply. According to the psychologist, Edmund Howell did not display any alarming change in behavior during their last sessions. In their early meetings, he was counseling him for the loss of his wife. Eventually, the writer talked about nothing else but the fictional world in his book. As his therapist, he was trying to understand the correlation between Edmund's current mindset to his fantastical world that he invented. However, even the psychologist himself was astounded by how he described it so intricately and realistically. It sounded as if the writer was talking about an actual place instead of something he only imagined. 
With all the statements that I managed to gather, they kept on mentioning one particular topic. It was clear that Edmund Howe became deeply obsessed with the world that he made in his story. He was not a sociable person, and he rarely went out of his home. There was nobody left to ask, and nowhere else to go. I then realized that perhaps I had to use a different approach in order to move the investigation further. Instead of trying to dig deeper into the writer's background, I decided to learn more about the world that he wrote. In the story, the main character's name was Levine Chase. He learned about the existence of this unknown world when he first saw it in his dreams. He initially thought that it was just a figment of his imagination or a surreal composition of random places in his memory. However, he kept on dreaming about the same place again and again. Unlike most dreams which a person would forget when he wakes up, Levine could remember even the smallest detail of this surreal realm. In a very small delay between his sleep and waking up, he saw his own body laying on his bed. It was then when he realized that it was actually astral traveling. It is a parapsychological state of consciousness where a person's spirit momentarily leaves his body to wander elsewhere while sleeping. Eventually, Levine grew fond of the dark world's gloomy scenery. He looked forward to going there every night. He was able to see the inhabitants and recognize the threats that he should avoid. But it was virtually impossible to map the terrain because of the constant smoke in the air, which severely dampened his line of sight. After a few weeks of astral traveling, something even more bizarre started happening to him. Levine woke up one day with his clothes covered with ashes. His physical body also started getting transported along with his spirit. After realizing that it was possible to teleport himself to the other world, he became even more interested in it. Several nights passed, and the time he was spending in the dark realm grew longer and longer. He started to bring things back with him to the living world, and one of them was the jawbone of a quadrupedal creature that chased him while he was wandering in the dark. Levine became so attached to the other world that he eventually wished to stay there permanently. After two months of gathering information and observing, he finally decided to begin his exploration properly. In the beginning of his adventure, he wandered aimlessly until he saw something in the dark skies. He mentioned an avian entity with six wings soaring effortlessly, and he described her as a 12 feet humanoid with the tail of a scorpion and the face of a woman. Her appearance was akin of that of an angel with a wingspan that was twice of her body length. Aside from her paper white face that looked like a porcelain mask, the entirety of this avian deity was all black. She had a pair of wings on her back, on her arms, and on the sides of her reverse joint legs that had talons instead of toes. Levine followed this majestic being in order to find a path across the land that was formed with ashes instead of sand. This winged creature played a vital role in his survival. Levine almost died a couple of times when he lost sight of her, while the volcano sped out thick clouds of smoke that enshrouded the entire terrain. It seemed that her presence made the hostile creatures back away. In the later chapters, Levine revealed that he was searching for a tree. There was only one tree in the entire realm, and he referred to it as the vein of all things. Since it was the only tree within this dark and dreary world, the avian being was bound to perch on it. However, following the direction of its flight was not an easy task. Half of the story was about the main character trying his best to survive the journey while keeping up with the avian deity. Just like what his fans had mentioned, the main character was a complete reflection of the writer Edmund Howell. The name Levine Chase was also the very first pseudonym that he used in his early works. While I was looking around in his office, to see if I could find some clues to his whereabouts, I discovered that there were more similarities between the main character and the author, which the readers were unaware of, including the jawbone in a jar of ash. The other items that were mentioned in the book were also displayed on a shelf. Out of curiosity, I took the bone and had it examined by professionals. It was quite thick. It had a sharp set of teeth, which suggested that it belonged to a carnivorous creature. Because of its easily observable characteristics, I was quite dumbfounded when the results of the examination stated that the bone belonged to a human. It looked more like a mandible of a tiger. 
As a detective who solely relied on evident facts and logic, I was deeply perplexed by the clues that I found about this case. It was quite obvious that the story was about Edmund Howell himself, but I couldn't get myself to believe that the world he described might actually exist. The evidence he had left suggested that the Dark Realm was a real place. The last book he had published was more like a diary than a novel. The more I continued my research, the more baffling it became. Oddly enough, Edmund was not the only person who knew about the other world. According to the source, it was first mentioned in a journal of a Spanish voyager who encountered some eccentric cultures during his travels. One of them was an isolated tribe with bizarre supernatural practices. In their belief, there was another world in between the living and the dead. This place was inhabited by ethereal entities and lost spirits. Stripped off of dignity and humanity, the corrupted human souls lurked in the dark and walked in all fours, like wild animals. Within this realm was the oldest of all trees, and it connected all the things across different worlds. According to them, their elders used this tree to talk to the ones who passed away. The description of this tree in their belief eerily resembled the one which Edmund referred to in his book as the vein of all things. Several generations passed, and the same realm was mentioned again from different parts of the world, portrayed in various languages by individuals that were thousands of miles away from each other. They described the same dark place, even though they never heard nor seen the other's work. It was incorporated in a poem, a folklore, a song, and other forms of medium. One of them was from an artist, and he made a painting of a winged being that was very similar to what Edmund wrote about. Furthermore, the artist also painted other creatures from the realm that wasn't mentioned in the book. The most majestic one of all was a multiple-legged giant that resembled a colossal isopod towering over the volcanoes. This slow-moving titan roamed over the farther parts of the realm and served as a mobile shelter for the smaller creatures. It seemed that the artist managed to travel farther into the other world than the writer, and he was able to see other things that Edmund was yet to encounter. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, he also went missing and was never found. It was possible that the world in Edmund's story was inspired by this lore. However, the other clues suggested otherwise. For those who were able to explain how they came up with the idea of the Dark Realm, all of them claimed that they saw it in their dreams. In Nordic folklore, it mentioned that the other world's air was never meant for a human to breathe in. It would heighten a person's sense of awareness that he would be overwhelmed by the sensations he would begin to feel, hear, or even smell. Even though it could drive a person mad, it would also reveal how naive he was in his surroundings. Little by little, my investigation was finally reaching a conclusion. Despite its inexplicable nature, things began to add up. Along with the few others who knew about it, Edmund Hall went to the Dark Realm and had no intention of going back to the only world that we know. Given that I had no way to prove it, I should have just stopped my investigation right there. However, I couldn't help feeling dissatisfied about the outcome of this case. Either way, I didn't even know how I would report it without sounding insane. I decided to dig even deeper, and I soon came across information about a blind man in Mexico named Adelacio Lopez. Apparently, the old Mexican was a medium who could talk to spirits. In addition to that, the report also claimed that it could temporarily transport a person's consciousness so he could talk to the spirit face to face. Using his ability, I could force my way into the dark realm by connecting to the spirit of Edmund Howe. Needless to say, I wasn't paid well enough to go through with this just to locate someone who disappeared on his own accord. However, aside from finding the writer, I was also driven by my restless curiosity about the existence of this realm in between the world of the living and the dead. I flew all the way to Mexico in order to meet the 87-year-old blind medium in hopes that the information about him was true. Accompanied by my contact, we went uninvited to the house of Adelacio. After persuading his sons with a hefty compensation, they allowed us to meet the old medium. Before I even said anything, he already knew my intentions for coming there. Since there was no point to hide it, I told him about the case of the missing rider and the dark realm. 
Apparently, he was also well aware of its existence. He was holding a cane that was embellished with a collection of sharp teeth. When I took a closer look, they were similar to what Edmund had in his office. Like the eccentric tribe's paranormal belief, the blind medium claimed that he was also using the tree in the other world to contact the dead. Due to his blindness, he was already used to the dark and lived his life by using his other senses. And in the dark realm, his sensitivity was heightened even further. As a result, he could sense an attack before they came. He claimed that he was able to take down a couple of wild creatures who lurked in the dark when he was younger. When I said that I wanted to go there, he looked displeased and told me more about them. The savage, quadrupedal beings in the other world were the humans who lost their way. The atmosphere in the dark realm was simply not meant for humans, and those with weak spirits would easily give in to their savage selves. Eventually, their bodies would begin to mutate in order to survive this harsh nature of the realm. He said that the rider was probably turned into one, and the same thing could happen to me as well. What the blind medium had told me was very similar to the beliefs of the tribes and what was mentioned in the folklore. I grew more hesitant than I already was, and I questioned the strength of my own will. However, the fact that a handful of witnesses were able to see so much of this dark realm could only mean that they managed to keep their humanity in spite of their long exposure to its effect. After considering the possibilities, I decided to take the risk and hoped that my spirit would be strong enough to protect my sanity. It took a while before I was able to convince the blind medium to lend me his ability. He wrapped my hands with a bandage that had prayers written on it. He said that this would keep my physical body from disappearing without my own will. The first parts to get transported to the dark realm were the hands since we instinctively used them to feel the things around us. He also made me wear an amulet to protect me from the savages. If ever the binds on my hands were not enough to keep my body to the living world, the protection amulet would be transported along with me. I laid in the center of what looked like a ritual circle, and the blind medium lit up a handful of incense as he started chanting. After a few minutes, my consciousness began to wane, the idea was to force my spirit out of my body so I could astral travel. With this ability, he would teleport my spirit to wherever the rider might be. However, the effect of his ability varied from one world to the other. There was a chance I could be thrown into another place, but I was willing to take the risk. His chant reverberated in my ears until I completely blacked out. I kept on repeating to myself what my main goal was in hopes that I would not be distracted by the unknown world that was about to unfold before me. Find the rider. Bring him back. Find the rider. Bring him back. One of the things about the book that was often discussed among the fans and the critics was the ending. In the end, Levine did not find the tree in the realm. He kept on wandering about when he lost sight of the avian deity, and he never saw her again. The main character did not encounter the six-winged being by chance. He deliberately waited for it to come his way. He waited for its arrival for days. When he sensed that she would not be coming back for a long while, he decided to blindly explore the dark realm on his own. The story ended with the main character walking through the thick smock, and he was never seen again. The next thing I knew, my feet were sinking into a mound of ashes and I could feel an unnatural chill crawling up my spine. It felt as if all the pores in my skin were wide open and the range of my hearing had ceased a hundredfold. When I opened my eyes, it looked like I was looking through a wide-eyed lens. My line of sight had also increased significantly. Sadly, there was nothing to see. All that I saw in front of me was a sea of ashes and I was surrounded by a thick wall of smoke that covered everything. As I took my first step into this other world, I noticed that it was considerably lighter. Perhaps it was because my body wasn't with me. The blind medium told me that I should keep reminding myself that I was separated from my physical self. In this way, I wouldn't forget to return. I looked around, and I could hear some faint voices coming from afar. I cast my eyes above and below. Without any reasonable explanation, I became aware that there were other realms beyond where I was standing. Just like what the others had described, 
This level of awareness was flooding my head with new information that I couldn't even begin to fathom. A few meters away from where I stood, I could sense that there was a pack of savages approaching. The blind medium was right. Without relying on my sight alone, I knew what I had to know to keep myself from harm's way. To be able to recognize a presence was completely unheard of to a human that I couldn't even begin to explain it. It felt like another sense that I was born with, and yet I had never used it until now. But even though I knew that a threat was coming from the wall of smog, there was nowhere to go. Without any certainty, I just ran forward. I was able to get away from the savages, but I was also lost. After wandering aimlessly for a while, I finally saw something. There was a silhouette of a towering tree amidst the wall of smoke in front of me. And there was also something big, perched on its thickest bough. Even though I had yet to see what was actually there, I could tell that it was her. As I took a step forward, I felt like I was being pushed away. I was jittering, but my sheer desire to see her with my own eyes was stronger than my fear. Roosting on the colossal tree that bore no fruit nor a single leaf was the majestic avian deity. Profoundly astounded and afraid at the same time, I gazed at her in complete awe. Her presence was domineering, and her otherworldly appearance was beyond breathtaking. As I mustered all courage to move further, the deity didn't even bother to notice my presence. Before her, I felt that my existence was insignificant. The roots of the tree were larger than the largest structures ever built by men. A single one of them would be enough to create a canyon in our land. Beneath one of them was the missing rider, Edmund Howell. He succeeded in finding the tree and he turned his head to see me as I approached him. He snickered when I told him that I came there to find him. However, just as I'd expected, he had no intention of returning to the living world. His back was leaned against the root, and there were veins growing from it that bound his body to the root. His body was assimilated to the tree. He told me that he was talking to his wife from another realm just a moment ago. And perhaps that was his goal all along. He said that his physical body would soon be absorbed by the tree, and he would soon join his wife on the other side. Despite his rather unsettling situation, he looked happy. And I had no right to take that away from him. He reached down his pocket and handed me a pen with an engraving of his signature, and this would prove that I found him. When I held the pen in my hand, I realized that I was in trouble. I should not be able to hold it unless my hand was already transported into this realm. The rider smiled and waved goodbye as I closed my eyes. A few moments later, I started hearing the chanting of the blind medium once again. Fortunately, I was able to return to my body safely. With the missing rider's pen in my hand, I closed the case and reopened the unsolved murder of his wife. Edmund told me everything that I needed to know in order to find the murderer. After a month, the criminal was put behind bars. Needless to say, I lied about the missing rider's case and told my superior that I never found him. Nobody would believe me if I told them what really happened. However, what I learned from the case was far greater than what this world has to offer.